Yeah. <sighs> okay. Have you got all your um, material for the upcoming course? I got materials. I, I, uh, they look so similar to me with the uh, mm -hmm. 38 yeah. watts hits and stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I haven't looked at them at all, really. <laughs> I mm -hmm. filed them neatly. <laughs> uh, yeah, almost. It's obviously you know, a lot of old ground. You know, which, uh, we, by this time, probably covered repetitively. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. Have you been put into your group? You have been. Yes, Ooh. have you? Have, have you been put into a group? Yes, yes. Okay. How many yeah, people I'm, are in it? Uh, well, we are now seven, I think, which I think is pushing it. Yeah. Yeah. But one well, of them well, is Rupert. So that's, ah. <laughs> I'm saved. <laughs> you, got, you, you got the short straw, did you? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't tell him that. <laughs> oh, no. Because, well, just as well, it's not recorded. Yeah. <laughs> how about you? Have you got a local group? Uh, how many people are there around? For you? Um, I, I, I am in an in a, in a Asian time zone group, uh -huh. um, which has got a total of four, including myself. Um, I, I don't I know these people that um, are his group. That, Rupert. Ah. Rupert will appear as a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let us down now, Rupert. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I was just saying about uh, the groups we've been put into. And uh, oh, I was just yeah. saying, that, saying that you got the short straw by getting Elfie in your group. <laughs> What is he like? He's so oh, rude. Gary. So rude. <laughs> I know where it's from. It's a backlash from calling him a friend. He spooked. <laughs> it's been very quiet. Oh, I think I'm just trying to see what's going on. Can you hear yeah, me? you sound further away than Gary. And you're only down the road, really. Is that better? Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Oh, my microphone is a long way away. Just... Are you snowed in? Uh, well, we we have snow, um, uh, but not snowed in. <laughs> is there any snow on your side of the country? Nope, none, none at all. Uh, not <sighs> here either. <laughs> oh, really? Is a surprise? <laughs> <laughs> That's a first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we did have a cold snap once again. There we go. Look. That's my oh, garden. Oh, you got snow. Oh, very pretty. Oh. Very pretty. Mm. Nice. I haven't quite got the lighting proper in this room yet, I'm afraid. But uh, high contrast. It looks it looks very avant-garde. Hmm. I think we had a very avant-garde uh, owner uh, before. He was a musician. Well, what can you say? Are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to repaint these walls, because I think he painted direct on the plaster, and that's very dark colour. Hmm. Anyway, we'll see. So what, who have you got in your group, Gary? Anybody we know? Um, no, no. Uh, the, there's um, somebody in Bali, so um, I just, well, I imagine it's um, an expat type from Australia. Uh, that's my assumption. Uh, there's a lot of Australians in Bali who live as uh, expatriates. Uh, there's also a guy, I think he's from Hong Kong. Um, not, not sure. And there's this other guy who's in Thailand. Uh, is an American uh, monastic. So there's only four? Oh, and there's me, yeah. Ah, so maybe they, you've, so you can organize your time to be more um, appropriate for you. 
law. Yes, so obviously we'll be meeting at times which are suitable for this area mm. of the world. Right. Well, that's, oh, that's cool, good. isn't it? Yeah, Otherwise yeah be and new night. people to meet, yeah. Well, yes, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I do have some trepidations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're not alone. No. I, I've lived in Asia, Asia for a long time, and, you know, you, you do get to, to um, stereotype certain types of foreigners who come here, and uh, I do tend to, to find myself doing that. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that a reaction? <laughs> oh, it's, no, it's all reactive. Oh, yes, totally. I've got a well, just for an example, just to, uh, you know, I've, I've, there's probably two prejudices at work here. Uh, mm -hmm. But the first prejudice is against um, uh, foreigners living in Bali. You know, <laughs> Anyone? I, I, actually, I actually own a, a, a villa in Bali and I haven't been to it in five years. I just really don't like the place, despite <laughs> having property and stuff. <laughs> you know, it, now it, it, you're you saying. Know, well, well, I've got a business there as well. I've got a branch office, of course. So that, that was the reason for it. But, uh, you know, I had intended to go there occasionally, but, you know, uh, yeah, it just wasn't my scene at all. Um, mm -hmm. There's lots of uh, foreigners living in, in, in the South. Uh, it's just a, rather a rank... Uh, tourist culture. It's just not not uh, just not my place at all. Uh, but anyway, so, so that's prejudice number one. You know, what we call bullies or, or white people who live in 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 Bali. So I've got that first negative reactivity. I haven't met the guy, of course. I'm just completely <laughs> just generalization. That's fine. Yeah. React a reactive judgment. Um, and of course, my second reactive judgment, it's probably even worse, is um, this guy, he, he's, he's, uh, he is a monastic. He, he, I think he actually runs some sort of temple there um, and, or, or runs some sort of thing, uh, you know, monastic type thing. And he runs courses for Westerners sort of, uh, um, I don't know, I mean, I guess perhaps I'm thinking that I've sort of grown out of that rather a long time ago. Um, you know, cosplay and, uh, and Orientalism and, and that sort of thing. So here, so here I am bringing all these sort of negative prejudices into a group. So, and I'll, I'll probably make them come true just by believing them. So, so I, I've really got to work on giving people a go and it's going to take some effort. Yeah, I wish them luck too with you in the group. You know? Well, yeah, they, they, they set could eyes argue. on you. Yeah. They, they could argue. What's this we hippie here? Yeah. <laughs> Why did we have to have him? Why couldn't he go? Yeah, in another time. Oh. Yeah. Well, oh, but, you know, it's, it's not, but you know, that, that's to be expected. I mean, I mean. But you know, I guess we're not going to get you know Orientalist um, monastics from you know in Europe. I'm, I'm guessing that there's probably not going to be uh, any there who, who follow the course. Um, but anyway, um, it'll be interesting to know why he he's on a secular Buddhist course. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I was had the same notion. Yeah. yeah. I think it, uh, there will be two two kinds of people very roughly. I just propose, you know, real uh, people who got problems with Buddhist belief and really are glad to find someone where you don't have to do that. And uh, quite um, dedicated Buddhists who want to widen their appeal. I could imagine mm. because that's that's what I met so far in a way, you know. But then there's mm. there's so much in between and so much so much just um seekers of all sorts aren't there? of of um mm. um that that do all kinds of things um and and have all 
you know, like lots, lots of <sighs> from yoga to shamanism to whatever, and they just they they like find another honeypot, something to engage with. So there's that too, but it's well, all I think, uh, interesting. I, I, guess. I think that's you know a point I've been thinking about is that, that there's a um, a disproportionate number of um, teachers of, of various description, uh, teachers in the sort of you know, meditation or, or you know, as monastics or um, people who do courses on various things. There seem to be a, a disproportionate number of those um, uh, people with those oh. lots of backgrounds. Uh, and alternatively, there's also a group um, who, who you could probably you know, roughly equate to being healers of various descriptions. You know, people are sort of dealing directly with people, um, you know, you know, psychologists, doctors, or, or whatever. Um, and then you've got sort of the messy in the middle. So you know, there are some sort of, you can sort of see some, the broader outlines of you know, people who actually uh, do these, these courses. And I guess my point here is that it, it's, it seems, not always, but sometimes that the teachers have not come there to, to learn, um, but to perhaps yeah, add to their knowledge, or, you know, quite uh, clearly. Um, but I guess trying to, to incorporate that into a teaching practice. Um, mm. where, 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 and it's always, you know, and ultimately with a teaching practice, the problem with it, the dilemma in it, is that, you know, you have to be paid for that service. And then it gets a bit messy uh, and, and compromised or, pot or, or potentially compromised. Um, so, yeah, that's just my half thought. Yeah. How do you know? I, I mean, you seem to to have you Googled those people? Do, do we have a whole list of participants? Do we know how many they are all together? When you say um, there's a high proportion of teachers, just in in your little group, you mean? Or oh no no no, I do mean in, in the in the in the last um, secular dharma course. As oh in, um, oh, I see. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah. But, but okay. But it also applies to a lot of the, the smaller um, uh, online groups that I've, I've, I've done uh, uh, through Body College as well. Mm. Um, so that, that, that's what I was referring to. Uh, so, so in this particular, in my little group here for this course, um, well, yeah, obviously I did my own background checks. Um, there was nothing official. <laughs> um, it's just habitual. So <laughs> I always, always do, always, always do due, due diligence. That's what we call it. Due right. diligence. We use that word, those words every day. If we send you names, can you do our group too? <laughs> oh, sure, sure, yeah. Find them on the dark web. <laughs> Has Bitcoin traders? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Mm. I'd... I'd I think um, I, I have to see it as a reciprocal thing, you know. It's also like a, um, it's it's for me, but it's also for Stephen and uh, everyone else is invited in, because I I think uh, Stephen and I need dialogue about it really. I, I mean, when I just look at our group, you know, it's just been. To, uh, so um, inspiring and and um, um, you know hugely beneficial for me personally, and and way beyond what the course was. You know, because the 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 uh, the joy in the dialoguing and the inspiration and that that uh, that effortless motivation that it gives me to study this or look into that, you know, and you send ideas and I just follow it. That is effortless motivation for me. And why would I not engage with it? That would be for me senseless, you know, when it's so 
because um, with lots of other things, uh, it just takes more effort to engage with it. And um, so I'm, I'm really a strong believer to when it when it just uh, you know my my neurons just they they don't need to quarrel about is that important? Do I really need to do that now? Um, it, they just take me, and and that I I love that effortlessness mm -hmm. in it. That only comes mm -hmm. with dialogue, and if there is you know just a, an, a couple more people who are doing it for me in that course, then that's great. And uh, mm -hmm. just the regular engagement with with the course, we see what that works. And it'd be interesting if it works or not. If it's completely frustrating. Mm -hmm. Because there's 270 mm. of us sitting there, you know, never mm -hmm. obviously saying a word back other than to ourselves under our breath. Mm. Um, and um, but it's good for Stephen too. He needs the dialogue to to uh, get his ideas going. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and and that's a good thing. You know, he's not writing a new book. I think last time we saw him, he really didn't know. Where where mm. he would go, what his next thing mm. would be, and there is uh, a mention of a, of the next thing, which I think is that that speaks to me that it that it had something to do with our course because we talked about that complexity and about what that 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 that, you know, that, that got clearer there that it is more about the questions and the answers, and so he I find that working book title that he has really interesting mm -hmm. and, and then, then he will talk more about that than about his last book if you ask that mm -hmm. would be my expectation because he's like that he doesn't yeah. like old ground either <laughs> yeah. what, what is his new book called uh, what is uh, it called uh, the ethics Beyond. of et, no ethics of uh Com is it complexity? Um, no. Um, Ethics of. Um, well, what is it? Something to do with situational ethics, whatever that title is. Yeah. Um, no, it's definitely an ethics. Yeah. An, an um, ethics of uncertainty, I think. Uncertainty, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's Rupert's thing about, you know, that fourth task of write this, write that, and that, that it doesn't belong, um, which I, and I will always hold on to because it's a, it's a very right thing that you, that you introduced, Rupert. So that, that would go yeah. against this, you know, it's uncertain. As soon as you introduce certainties, the whole thing goes wonky. Um, and he has to do away with that last oh, yeah, yeah. fourth step. Mm -hmm. the, the, the paths have to go. <laughs> I, I do, you know, it was a very good idea to transform the truth into truths into tasks. But that fourth one is has survived, and it shouldn't have. Well, he's it, it, in his in the workbook. Um, he, he changed his well, not changed it, but the path eight things, the eightfold path virtues: perspective, imagination, application, mindfulness, focus, voice, work, survival, and some of those were things that he used on the last course. Because uh, I remember he used application instead of effort, and he's used work instead of um, appropriate uh, uh, livelihood. Whatever, livelihood, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. then he used survival instead of something, and I can't remember what it was. was it the the last one, but he looked like he's used perspective instead of vision. And imagination instead of understanding. Mindfulness is still mindfulness. Voice is still 
voice or whatever it was before appropriate Each. speech. Our focus must be. I can't remember, but he's so he's he's, he's still got them, um, and this is in. There's so many numbers that I have. So in the in the thing, he's got thirty-two dimensions of awakening, and then one, two, three, and four. And they're separated into the one has got five things in it. Uh, anyway, it's too complicated. Lots of numbers and lots of things. But in the last one, there are eight. Like, and it says eightfold path and it says virtues. So I'm I'm guessing it's still it's still there, but under a different interpretation. Have you read the workbook? Of course not. <laughs> First thing I did, go read read all this because I'm very thing, impressed that you have. <laughs> no, well, of course. Look, I'm paying for this. Um, and this is an an essay he wrote, Secular Buddhism. I think it's the first time he talks about secular Buddhism. He said in 2012, and I'd not read it before, so it's an essay published somewhere, and it's quite interesting because it goes into goes into the normal stuff which we know about about Pali canon going back to the source material and um, how Buddhism has stuck on karma and rebirth and stuff and he doesn't think he should have done and it goes big on noble truths and his tasks and I when I reread it it made me think of something because I've, I'd always taken it, yes, he's right, in that Buddhism as a religion has tacked on things to what Gautama said. That's the sort of premise of what secular Buddhism is. is that you go back to the what he really said, and then you start from there. You don't start from Buddhism. So he's sort of saying Buddhism is wrong because it became a religion and it tacked on things. And it specifically, it tacked on karma and rebirth. But then I was thinking about something else and it occurred to me that, and, and noble truths, that's a big deal because the word truth. Why, I can understand why a religion a hierarchical religion would want to attach things like karma and rebirth in the same way that Christianity has um, redemption and heaven. So it's this is it's it, we will look after you. You've got you have um, you you can survive this this time on earth and either you can go to heaven or you keep being reborn until you reach nirvana so in both religions and i guess all religions there's an option that the religion could offer you of salvation now what he's saying is what stephen's saying is i think that um that's not what gotama said gotama said the, the there is no salvation outside of yourself it's a it's it's internal thing and there isn't a rebirth and there isn't anywhere else after you die and i can see that i can see why religion would do that but why would religions tack on truth why would they say this has to be these have these things has to be a truth because what stephen's saying is that gotama didn't want he didn't need truths. He said, you've got to question things yourself. Um, if this is what I've found, you question it. I, you, you try it, you do the questioning, and if it works for you, then it's great. But you don't need truths. Now, I can't think of a way of having something like secular dharma as being, a, in broad terms, being accepted 
without truth, without have something that is a foundational element. And it, what made me think of it is because of the American, the interesting stuff that's happening in America. Democrats have truths. They have democracy as a truth. And they have the constitution as a truth. These are the things that they stand up in, in this impeachment trial and they say, these are truths. These things actually happened. These things are the foundations of what we believe in. Whereas uh, QAnon and the Republicans will have different truths. But QAnon supporters believe in the truth that they believe. They believe in Trump. They believe what Trump says. And I actually think that Trump believes the things that he says as truths. He believes that immigrants are rapists and they would destroy the country. He believes that you stop them by building a wall. He believes that jobs should be open for Americans. And those things are truths. So you can, you can have all your philosophy you like, but if you don't have truths attached to it, you're not going to have a large following of people. So you can't have, um, it seems to me, this, this idea of a secular dharma without truths. And for me, the truths are scientific truths. They're, they're evidence-based truths. So I think things like evolution and relative general relativity, quantum mechanics, these things which, which, we, which we have confidence in because we can reproduce the effects of what we can investigate and that supports the, the theory, the hypothesis, then they become truths. They become things that support the philosophy, that underpin the philosophy, because they fit within the same milieu, they fit within the same worldview as the more philosophical elements that come out of the thinking, which was the sort of the stuff that the um, Gotham is talking about the, which I guess is the ethical perspective. Anyway, it just occurred to me that when I was rereading this, that there's something strong about the truths, and I'm not sure that those truths, the noble truths, were there to put put there in order to make it more religious. I think they were put there because people need them. You have to believe in something. Yeah. yeah, I think you know that that's something I've thought about last week sometime. The fact that you have you know certain foundational beliefs, and uh, in, in my case, it's in the main evidence-based um, or, or based on some sort of science, however imperfect or, or incomplete. Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, if you don't start from those scientific and, and in particular biological foundations, then you, you can be talking at very, very different levels or, or yeah, there's, there's no uh, synchronicity between, between the wavelengths. You know? We are literally not on the same wavelength when, when you talk to somebody from a metaphysical level. Or even someone from the, from the social sciences, it's much the same. Uh, people have not been, you know, or have no conception of you know, uh, science and, and biological science in particular. Uh, I, I just find it difficult for, for, for people to call themselves social sciences when they just have, simply have none of that knowledge at all and have no desire for it, and in fact, you know, distrust it. Um, and I, I put, you know, social science types group them sort of along with, you know, some of the more metaphysical type people, um, because the, 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 the ground is, is not there. They have no ground. It's, you know, um, it, it is not grounded in, in, in evidence or, or in some sort of, you know, science. So, you know, I think that is a, 
an issue, uh, and that is why I think we have difficulties in wavelengths when trying to discourse with uh, such type of people. Yeah, I, I think you're right, and uh, it's there is this sort of postmodern approach to the social studies, which is there is just a distrust of science, a, a, which I'm not quite sure where where it's come from, but it. But I, I think you're right, and it does make life difficult. And maybe that, because that's quite a strong element in our society. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing to have people with very different sort of outlooks, but it's a bit, it's a bit strange. I've always have found it odd that there is a a strong reluctance to accept rationality within people in this, some people, in fact, probably quite a lot in social sciences, distrust of science, which is a bit weird, isn't it? Well, uh, I think that the problem is that it's been conflated, you know, many people confuse uh, you know, individual scientists as being science. Um, you know, yeah. whereas, you know, yeah. and, and obviously there's always conflict within science, that's part of the process. And, uh, and so, you know, I guess it, it's more a matter of people distrusting the, the noise that science makes, rather yeah. than yeah. trusting in the process of science and, and, and uh, the, the principle of being, yeah. uh, being it's, evidence You're right, it's, it's down to definition again, it's just a, it's a, yeah, it's just a word, isn't it? It's if you think of the word as being what we think of it as, as you say, a process, mm, yeah. then it's, it cannot really be a problem because it's a process. If you think of it as a thing and as scientists, and as you say, what scientists say, then it can be, it can be challenged. Maybe. I don't know. Isn't science just another way of uh, ordering things? I mean, it, it comes out of natural philosophy, and that was a way of ordering things. But it that had alchemy in it as well. So we we have kind of gotten rid of some of it that has been proven not accurate, and now we believe a new set of things. Uh, and in the process of science, it will get a lot of that will get overruled as well. Just like, you know, Einstein came along and and rewritten the book, and and that will happen again and again. So they're not a set of truths; they're a set of beliefs as well. They have a good method behind them, of deep thinking, and deep thinking is uh, an effort, and therefore. Um, a lot of people go for simpler systems of gathering their beliefs together, which don't, uh, you know, Jesus doesn't need so much effort, I think, um, as, as science. I need less precursor, you know, the material to, to be able to talk about it. I can just um, come with a few standard phrases and be an expert. Whereas uh, if you want to be a scientist in anything now, my goodness, it's quite complicated. I think that makes it less attractive. And, um, and as, as a method um, of finding things, uh, it's, it's as old as, as humankind. It's not a new thing. Um, and it has always only attracted a few and, and m more people are engaged in just another way of ordering things, which has, you know, comes a little easier following things. Uh, I don't need so much uh, hard thinking. I just go to the temple and, um, and, and um, slit a cow's throat or something. You know, that is... Well, yeah, on the other hand, you have theology <laughs> and all religions have theology and they have theologians. And those the theologians would be the, in inverted commas, the, the scientists, the, the thinkers, the, the, the deep thinkers and explorers of the ideas behind the religion. So whilst you might have followers who 
would just say, well, that's okay, I'll accept what these theologians have come up with. It doesn't mean to say that the religion itself can't suggest that it has a, a more complex underpinning. Whether it does or not is another thing. But I think you can have hierarchies of um, academia within the religions in the mm. similar way yeah. you have it within science. So it, you, you, we, you don't have to, most of us are not scientists. I'm not a scientist, but I accept the science because I, I suspect that if I could learn and do the same experiments, I would come to the same yeah. outcomes. But that's a belief. Uh, it's it's <laughs> having confidence in something. Yeah, it's having confidence. Did, that it, look, that it, I I think what's getting clear there is I mean uh, that there are no truths other than uh, purposeful truths, and we all believe, you know, that and and that makes it uh, a bit that that's close to belief. So our what what looks to us as a truth. Um, is is our truth very personal and comes with a purpose so uh, we we have we, we are never unbiased in that way so if it, it works for us to go with science that's great but it it works for a christian to work with their truths which are as true for them that we would look at it and say who believes that stuff and they would say well that's my truth i have direct experience of that or so and it it for their minds you know very highly intelligent people obviously you know the archbishop of someone uh, something that um, ha has that comes up with that kind of stuff and it is just in the same way as Trump believes that he had the biggest crowd at his inauguration, because it is a purposeful truth. It, he doesn't need numbers for that. It comes directly out. I'm the greatest and the people believe in me the strongest. It follows that I had the biggest crowd. That is a truth because of a there's a purpose behind it and 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 not it doesn't need anything else it doesn't need anyone counting or pictures or anything like that and he would die saying that you know and will probably and no one will um be able to convince him otherwise because it's it is a truth for him because it got that purpose i think that is so for any truth, and, and it doesn't matter if we say, yeah, but we got the better truth because we're scientists, uh, and then in comes the next person yeah, I, who believes I, in, in Mohammed and has the better truth. I, I, I see what you're saying. I just, I, I don't accept the argument, though. Hmm. And, and there are a number of reasons why. Um, but let's, to start with, if you took other Republican senators, at the moment, 45 out of 50 of them, or 44 of them, will say that Trump is true, what Trump did is true, or is right, Trump is right, that the, the truth lies with Trump. If Trump disappears and public opinion changes and they're more likely to be elected if they reject Trump, then they will, 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 they will reject that truth. So their truth, is I would yes is purposeful. It is. It depends on their purpose, which is to get re-elected. I don't think that's the same as a, a scientist, a physicist. A physicist might believe in string theory, but if they're a decent scientist, they would also accept that they might well be wrong, and that they will change when there is evidence presented. But they will only change when it's evidence presented, not to do with what their career. Now, I, I know that there are some scientists, and there's lots of us, who stick to things without moving. But there are, there, that's not everybody. And that's not what being a scientist is. And there are lots of scientists, it seems to me, you sort of have to presume they're telling the truth. And some do. I mean, you can actually read that people have changed their minds. And clearly, lots of people did change their minds when, for instance, there was you know, Einstein 
presented a new, um, it didn't take long for the scientific community to accept evidence-based uh, presumptions, or even in that case, wasn't even evidence initially. It was just a, a mathematical um, presentation of information. It wasn't evidence until later. But people did believe it and did change their opinions based on the evidence, not based on their careers. So I'm not sure that it's the same that for the truths in religion or in Trumpism are the same as, as I, I mean, I'd like you yeah, have a big trouble with the word truth, but, but it's, it's not necessarily that truths are, are, are that flexible and based mm -hmm. only on what you want them to be. Not for everything. Uh, then, uh, for me, you know, you don't take the science in. The neuroscience would, I think, argue that uh, the amount of our bias in that way is, it is just absolutely, you know, whenever you look at it, we clearly are under its influence. We don't know. And it is absolutely impossible to be truly you know neutral in that way it's we are not built like that that's not good for survival and therefore that faculty has just not developed so uh, i i um, i think there are many many more including in science a purposeful truth than uh, than a questioning mind i think our that's what it is our only safe haven is a questioning mind. You know, it's uh, someone who says, I'm not sure. An ethics of uncertainty goes that way. Um, uh, 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 an ethics of complexity would do it the same and say, well, that's my working hypothesis. Make me a good argument. And, and to stay open like that is all we can muster. And there's a few people in the world who are willing to do that but the majority would just rather follow a truth if you look into it it will be one with purpose uh, because that's how we are built I think you know we, and and so even if you try to stay open there will be many more purposeful truths in my mind than um, then uh, my little bit of choice that I kind of chisel out of that rock, which is uncertainty and complexity. And I probably am totally wrong, like now. <laughs> <laughs> that is my tiny little saving grace, like, you know, that bit of choice where I can say, and probably I'm talking total rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> so you you may say that now. <laughs> oh, well, that's, no. that's all all very well for for Elfie to say. But if, 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 if Elfie was the president of the United States with the finger on all the nuclear buttons, um, and she started believing in in her truths, which you know involved, I don't know, you name it. You know, goblins, elves, and fairies, mm. um, which they may do. I'm not saying anything against that. Uh, but but if that led you to sort of say, well, you know, I better start bombing the these you know these goblins and elves because I believe them and they're my truth. Um, <laughs> I, I, that's that's you know, and, and that's that may well be your truth, but yeah. but it is clearly also maladaptive in yes. terms of the species. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and if you voted for me, you're mad. <laughs> exactly. Well, they could, may well be mad. They may, may well have bought into that belief system. And, and so, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I sort of believe also, I mean, science is, is, is a belief. It's a belief that certain people who have undertaken you know, certain ways of thinking and certain experiments have come to certain conclusions. And I base my you know, I, I trust them to sort of uh, use a, a scientific method in order to, to advance uh, our knowledge. Uh, so, you know, it's my faith in those people. And, and of course, you know, as always in science, there's people who you trust and people who you don't trust. 
uh, but, but the process of science is still the same. Uh, it doesn't arrive at truth, but it, but it advances knowledge um, mm. of, of, the, of the nature of the world. And mm. so, so when, when a certain uh, you know, group of, of uh, you know, uh, people who have faith in, in science come up, up against uh, a group of people who, who believe in, in fairies, goblins, and elves, um, what do you do? Uh, do you sit by and say, oh, well, that's all cool, you know, we're all different and all that. Um, where, where, you know, you know that you know, the path that this particular belief is going to take you is not going to be a good place. Um, so you know, that, that for me is, is, is a question. Uh, not, not that, you know, there's, there's no belief in science. I believe in science. Uh, I, and I, I trust the people who are, you know, certain people who are scientists to give me information that is as good as they know, uh, you, know um, you know, truthful and, and, and honest. Um, but, you know, you're not, you're not, the, the majority of the world is not like that. People want simplicity. They want something, mm. you know, very simple to hang their hat on so they can just get on with their lives and, you know, uh, you know do whatever they do with their lives. Uh, and uh, they're not really concerned that, you know, what they believe might be complete garbage or they might know it's complete garbage, but don't care anyway, uh, as long as it gets them where they want to go, which, you know, who knows where that is. So, you know, there's this element of, you know, groups within a, within a society or societies or, or super tribe, um, you know, basically, holding on to their truths and, and in, a, in a lot of cases holding entire populations hostage to those loony beliefs. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, I, <laughs> well, I, I sort of understand what, what both of you are saying, but I, I do think I'm, I, I guess my point was that if secular Dharma is to become more mainstream, then it has to have associated with it of a, a worldview. Now we can call those truths or not. It, it's it, it's there's something that is acceptable, and in and I think. It needs to be, in our current world, it needs to be something which is, which for which we can produce evidence. We can show that this is as close as we understand things as the way things are at the moment. So God didn't create the world. He didn't make the trees or the sheep or the squirrels. Those came about from a different process and if you if you can associate that process with a philosophical and ethical approach then I think it would have more traction it would become more attractive than something which at the moment it seems to me has only a philosophical and ethical base so if our idea is that we want something like secular dharma to be broadly um, uh, disseminated i don't think what well, i think my initial point was i don't i can't see how that can happen unless it has truths in inverted commas associated with it Maybe the word truth is just too loaded, but it's that they, it, it should be associated with a worldview. And one of the things Stephen, I think, as I recall, often said that it didn't, that the, the nature of how things are is not important in what Gotama was saying. It's how we act that was important. And I'm not sure that you can have how we act separate from how things are and want people to accept it and embrace it. Well, 
Well, I, I think that takes a, a view of Dharma that, that you know, sees it as, as something universal, you know, that, that it's some kind of universalism. Um, and I, I've got an argument that maybe it's not. Maybe I, would, I, I don't think it's, it's only universal at the moment. It's only applicable. I mean, universal means what? Forever. Well, for all people. For, a, a universal religion as opposed to an exclusive religion, as, as you know, comparing to religions. It's, there's, there's universal religions which are open to all. All you have to do is believe that in this particular thing and you're, and, and you're, and you're in. Um, you know, other exclusivist religions or groups, you know, they'll be picky. They'll say only, only you know, certain people born of this particular genetic line are, are allowed to be members of this. Okay. So do you um, think that secular Dharma is exclusive then? I think it is. I, I think there are, there are, it's just one of, of perhaps, you know, got a, a dozen different outlooks which people could take. Uh, and and that, that, that outlook competes with those other um, uh, outlooks. And, you know, in terms of you know, the, the, the largest group, uh, the largest group is that group that, that, that needs to believe in a God because they cannot survive otherwise. And, and I think, you know, trying to convince you know, uh, theists to sort of take, uh, you know, on board a, a, a secular Dharma type of uh, um, approach to life would basically invalidate their, their, their religion or by, by automatically. Because as you were saying, that the very basis of, of the philosophy you know, should uh, involve, uh, you know, ha should have a, a scientific case. And if people do not choose to believe that scientific base because it threatens their, their belief in, in uh, in, in fairies and gods, then they simply won't. It, it just, it's just too threatening, too hard, too complicated. I don't want to live like that. I just want people to think for me, just tell me what to do, I'll, I'll do it. That's, that's the reality of most people. Well, um, you, you, you I agree. Could that. I but agree. you could have said that in the Middle Ages. You could have said the Middle Ages, Britain, Europe was like that for all, let's say, Every, almost everybody, but it's not like that for everybody now. There must, there's a, there is now a lot of people who don't accept theism. They are not, they are atheists, and there are lots of them. So you've gone from having zero to forty percent, let's say. Mm, I agree. I don't agree. But you don't think there are what forty percent of atheists in Europe? No. No, I don't. Well, you know how why? Many, how many are, because how many are there? when whenever I hear um, things like that, you know, it gets discussed on the radio. Of all those uh, people who are, you know, would not call themselves religious, they say, "And I believe, but I believe in something." It's our problem mm -hmm. with mortality. For most, well, hang on, hang on. They, they might they might be believing in amount. They might be believing people. in science. Well, no. Um, no, no, they believe in that there is something after death. That's what they mean. There is something How do you after know? death. Because they say that. <laughs> if they don't they really they say, I believe yeah. in something, they don't, that's not the same. No, no, I but, well, that I just thought I could take a shortcut and you, <laughs> you pick me up, which is right. You know, what do you mean you believe in something? Oh, well, there's something after death. We don't just go to nowhere. That's so people are agnostics, they are not atheists. But how For most that, people, that's too much. I would agree with Gary. But I, I, all, I said most people, yeah. I said 40% of people are yeah. atheists. Okay, so most people are not. You are if so you're saying, hopeful. Are you saying there are none? <laughs> are you saying there are no atheists? You can't there say that because I'm maybe, one. So. Maybe five percent of atheists. Right. Okay. So yeah. you've got five percent of atheists now. So you're accepting that five percent of the population. Yeah. yeah. And yet, in the Middle Ages, let's yeah. say five hundred years, there were none. I don't oh, know. Zero percent. Ah, da, ah, they were oh. though. I oh, think well, we might well, have done the better that? in the in the Greek. Uh, in the, I'm the not polis. talking about Greece. I'm talking about Middle Ages Europe. Okay. It, now, well, where I'm is the evidence sure. that in Middle Ages Europe there was five percent of the population where atheists? I would Where's not. In, I I would say they were there. I think. <laughs> What's they your were evidence? There. 
Well, what's your evidence now? <laughs> well, me. I've got, I've I'm here. I've, I've got evidence. I mean, yeah. If you, okay. If you said if you said you were an atheist here in Indonesia, you would you would be in a very bad way. Uh, if you said it in Saudi Arabia, for example, you'd be dead pretty quick. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a pretty big disincentive to call yourself an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Middle Ages. Yes. <laughs> But where, where would you? Do they exist? Are there now people in Saudi Arabia who are atheists but wouldn't say? Oh, I absolutely. assume yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that was yeah. no different in the Middle Ages. I'm absolutely sure. You know, oh. there were always these outliers, but outliers we are. Uh, well, we are marginal practice. Yeah, I'm... like Heidegger yeah. would say. <laughs> yeah. um, really, well, I don't think so. Oh, okay, you go, you go. <laughs> yeah, you, I, look, the the reason people are atheists is because, well, why? Why would somebody be an atheist? Why would somebody in the Middle Ages be atheist? Because it's because possible to think that... like that. How? It How? is what, possible what, to what think. What is your like evidence that? in the Middle Ages to base it on? Okay, I don't know. I have to be an agnostic about the agnostics in the Middle Ages. <laughs> How could you? I get, what, I, on what on what worldview is it presented in the Middle Ages that allows you that from which you could develop an atheist outlook? Um, this is prior to the Renaissance. Yeah. Well, you would never be able to write it down or say it. No, where would you? Where would your understanding of the possibilities of atheism come from? Because it's possible now, and we are not encouraged. <sighs> but why is it possible now? Because why they were no different. Why? Why am I an atheist? If you're an atheist, exactly. Why, why, why? are you an atheist? Uh, tell me why. Because then you know why a medieval person might have been an atheist. Well, one of the reasons Nothing's is, changed. What? Really yes, not. Darwin no, changed. What? Darwin changed the world. Yeah. For you, no. It's a story. Sorry. That's a story. It, it's, it's, it's not a story. It's science. <laughs> yeah, but, but they Darwin would actually, have thought that then. They well, on what down, basis? Well, on what basis was, was the, there was no Darwin? There was nobody who had put forward that theory. There were no dinosaur bones. There was no paleontology. There, there was no. The, there even was innate science. skepticism. There was innate skepticism. Ah, so skeptic, is skepticism the same as atheism? Not necessarily. No, you can still be a, a, a theist and, and, and be rational and whatever. I mean, the, the My point is that in order to be an atheist, you have to have, there has to be something for which you're basing your atheism on. Well, it's non-belief. It's not something, but it's a non-something. It's, it's a an absence of something. It's, a, it's, an an, it's, an, it's an absolutely, it's an absence of theism. Now, in order to, so theism being the, as you was, as you're suggesting, that's the normal state of affairs. So to extract theism, to extract the acceptance of a, a belief in God, you have to have something. There has to be something there for you to think, ah, that, that position is wrong. And there wasn't anything in the Middle Ages that presented that information. That's not That's, true. Uh, that, uh, look at just that Aristotle. He wrote, uh, you know, what was absolutely a precursor. Aristotle of, was not of... in the Middle Ages. He was first No, century... but he was read in the Middle it's Ages. A... He wasn't. And it was absolutely. And there were. He few... wasn't. He wasn't he, read. Very... He was banned. He, was, he wasn't some... read in the Middle Ages because he wasn't reading. It was in very few monasteries. There were. Yeah. There were, there were books, but he was not widely known. Until the Renaissance, no. there was not widespread, there could not have been widespread acceptance of Greek philosophy because it was not, it was written in Greek. Most people couldn't speak Greek. It was only in manuscripts in a few monasteries. So it wasn't, it couldn't have been that most people, the middle classes, the, the aristocracy, those people just didn't have access to this information. 
So that couldn't have been the reason they could have been atheists. Well, okay. So there was one atheist in a medieval monastery, yeah. having read Aristotle. That's possible. <laughs> but there's not 5%. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're, you're privileging privileging text and giving text a privilege that is probably exaggerated. Uh, because, wow. you know, people, most people haven't really read throughout history. They, they don't read text. They, they, they you know, hear stories or make things up or, or you know, make their own sort of uh, constructions of, uh, what, of reality. Um, and I mean, they can see reality all around. They can see an animal being born. They can sort of see it grow. They can sort of get old and, and whatever and can give birth and they can see it die. And they, and they look at themselves and say, that is also me. That, that will happen to me. So, you know, the, the, the notion of you know, birth and death is, is, was, would be all around you, certainly in the Middle Ages, in an agrarian type of uh, environment. Uh, your life and death would be staring in the face nearly every day. Um, so, you know, I don't think it takes text or, or access to, to uh, ancient philosophers uh, um, to, to, to realise that, you know, maybe all this uh, god malarkey is, is uh, just the stories that people made up. I think that's a pretty easy conclusion for, for many people of you know, average intelligence to make if they chose. So what you're saying that is that m most people weren't theists? Oh, I'd say most people were theists. The great majority, I would say. Or not, not the great majority. If I was to throw a figure out, I'd say you know, 60 to 70 percent would be theists in some, in some manner. You know? um, and, and that you know, people who are atheists um, you know, would, would, are definitely a minority. Uh, truth, truth uh, atheists. Uh, I, I think because it's too scary to be anything else. It, it's scary being an atheist. It, it's not. There's there's no comfort in it really whatsoever. And so people grasp onto things they can they can attach to, and they sort of say, you know, if I if I believe in this, then then everything will be okay. When I die, I'll just continue on, I'll, and I'll meet all my family again, and whatever. You know, these sorts of uh, dreams that people have to keep them going, these, these hopes uh, that, that this is the only thing that, that, that motivates me. And so, so a belief in an afterlife, I mean, that, that's what the vast majority of uh, cannon fodder in, 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 the, in the wars of history, that's what they believed in. They believed in, well, in yeah. that obviously forced, forced as well, uh, but, but you know, there was also this you know, belief in an afterlife has been a we can die gloriously on the, on the field of battle, and we shall sort of, you know, go to Valhalla and all this sort of sort of stuff. And it's a consolation to believe, to hope that maybe, even if you know, even if they don't really believe it, you know, that that, that, that they make themselves believe it yeah. you know, to, to to cut the comfort themselves because the reality is is too much. But aren't you suggesting that thirty percent of people don't have that view? Always. I'd, you know, I'd say that you know, a true atheist, somebody just does not consider gods as being part of the real world, um, you know, would, would maybe five, ten percent, maybe. But they've always been there. Oh yeah, I think so. I think so. It's just to be less visible in, in some in, in times like or well, depending it's not on your time can, and place. It's not something we can prove either way, is it? So it would be interesting to try. <laughs> well, like, we can't, but since we can't go back in time, and there is mm. no evidence for it, there is no way. Mm. Well, I think we can presume that we haven't, you know, biologically and, uh, and to to a certain extent culturally, we haven't changed all that much in the past ten thousand years. Um, no, so well, I, my... certainly not from the Middle Ages. We haven't we haven't changed a bit from then. I don't yeah. think, other than culturally. Well, but the, I think the cultural bit is the important bit. 
Well, it could be, but there is there is a fundamental problem, and I I I, I th think your question is really really interesting. You know, will this ever get any traction, and what will be necessary? I think if you don't offer an answer to mortality, uh, your chips are down. <laughs> we have a fundamental problem here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this is this is why I think, in terms of you know, rather than sort of proselytization and and uh, and uh, universalisms, sort of think of it just in terms of you know, certain people can think in these certain ways, and these certain ways can can ameliorate the the, the worst excesses of, of of those other belief systems. Uh, that perhaps they can sort of damp down some of the damage uh, that these other groups do. <laughs> Mm. It's just a, just a speculation, an idle speculation. But I, I just believe that there, you know there are archetypes of of of, uh, of people, and, and I think you know for the, the great majority, of, well, for the majority of people need theism in order to survive. I mean, not just belief in God, but a belief in an afterlife and a, yeah. a belief in you know, there's something after that happens. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because they don't want to confront the, 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 the grim reality that you know, yeah. when they go, they, they're, they're just simply not anymore. Yeah. And even in life, we need to be seen by something. You know, when, uh, when you haven't got a God, you cannot be fully seen because uh, no one has an overview over you until the last breath. It's not possible. You know, you, you don't know because you don't know what happened next and how you respond and all that. So I don't know for myself. Uh, it's very difficult to say what I am. Only someone outside of mankind can do that. And uh, so it's, it's both mortality to, to be taken care of after my demise, but also to be seen, to be, see, to be a, a something, a what, uh, can only happen from an outside of humankind. And we have a strong hankering for that. So, you know, when, when all the religious, when people say, oh, Jesus loves me unconditionally, or God knows me, there's all those hints in the scriptures of everything that where, where one is seen acknowledged as a as a relevant being and only God do that kind of thing so it's it's both in life and in death a, a really strong desire that just no why did we invent them you know because they do their job really well like that and uh, but we still need uh, uh, we still need a good method like a Dharma for the ten percent of atheists, that that is relevant, you know. We, that, I think that's still a very um, a, a good cause to work on that. It, it won't be for ninety percent, but but uh, we have always existed. We weird ones that are ready to question that and maybe live without that solace. Um, and we still need to know how to do this well. No? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm by. Uh, mm. If we had just, if we take school education, for instance, and we said, this education we're going to give you is the best education we can think of, but we're only going to give it to 10% of you because the rest of you, it's really not worth our while trying. Now, that isn't a, an approach that most people would accept. I, I think that's true. And, and that, which, which means that, you know, the, the techniques and, and uh, things that, that a Dharmic might do can also be, be done by, by anybody, which they can be, they can be taught. It doesn't mean it's completely useless not to teach Dharma to people who are theists. Uh, it can still be you know, partly or fully engaged in, in some, some manner, I think. Um, so you know, I don't think it, it means ignoring 
a general education of a, of a dharmic outlook that might be um, uh, but there is there is an assumption here that that only ten percent of people will be receptive to it, and I'm I, I think I, and you're so if, 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 if that's the case, well, why bother? Why bother with the other ninety well, percent? Now you know that in from a from an educational perspective, that's a, it's not a it's not a reasonable standpoint, is it? Oh, that's because like you're that thinking is. universal. That, that's a universal. And then you think, we, we will make this thing universal. Everybody will think the same. And if no, no, no. That's not what education does, is it? That's not. You're not going to say everybody's going to think the same. What you're saying is, I will present you the opportunity. Yeah. Now, but but if you're saying, well, I've presented the opportunity, but ninety percent of you aren't going to get it. Oh, no, I, 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 don't I think, think that's an odd. No. Pres- I, I I don't accept that premise. I think is what I'm really well, saying. I don't think well, this is back- exclusivity to only 10% of mm. the population have got the potential to benefit from they, this. I, I, I just don't think that's, I don't think that's, that's, that's right. Because and I, I think that the, the I think that the things the have changed over time. I think that a lot of people think in a, in a way that they would not have thought without the development of cultures over time, primarily science. And, and rational, the presentation of rational thought. And, and I don't think rational thought is something that is of, you know, it came as a byproduct, as an accident of evolution. Uh, but, it, but and some people have used that not because it's there as for everybody as a sort of survival tactic, but because it gives you other opportunities so in a way they're sort of it's non-evolutionary it's not there for survival it gives you other potential and you don't have to use it but you can and i think through education more people have been using it and have got benefits from it and i think that that changes over time and I think that there's evidence that it changes over time. So I don't think it's the same as it was in a time when there was less opportunity for people to study rational thought processes and the, and the outcomes of them. But I'm quite happy to accept I might well be wrong. But that's just how I... I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. Um, <laughs> just going back to <laughs> that, I might well be. Wrong. Back, <laughs> um, I'll go back to what you're talking about. You know, the ground, or, or what I forget what you how you referred that, that, that the fundamental um, beliefs uh, that, that underpin um, uh, a practice of dharma, uh, which necessitated you know um, what could be described as an atheistic or, or, or worldview. Or, or a scientific worldview. That's not, that's not quite atheistic. I think I don't believe in atheism. It's just this sounds silly. Um, so, so basically, a scientific world, worldview that sort of has established certain things that are known and uh, certain other things which are uh, as yet unknown. Uh, and on, upon that basis, upon that sort of non-religious basis, that, that, that you, you sort of build a, a, an understanding of Dharma. So the question is, how do you do that with a with a theistic person? It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't mean that they can't be influenced by by dharmic ways of thinking, or even to a large extent practice dharmic practices. Uh, but it does mean the ground on which they that they base their practice is is uh, theistic, and and therefore probably, in my mind at least, uh, incomplete. Yeah, I. I, I, I... I, I, th- I think you're. Abs- I, I agree absolutely. Um, and, and there is no completeness, is there? I mean, there's no. This is. There's no rightness to this. There's no. All I. I think all of what my interest was is that, as I said before, you know, if 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 this is something of value, it's difficult for it to develop, perhaps without some truths without some worldview and maybe that's not important maybe it doesn't want to develop further maybe it will always be 
a niche. And maybe that's that's fine. I think it's just it's fine. Yeah, I don't know really. I think that. Well, we'll put it this way: if you had a a, a group of Trumpists and a, and a group of Dharmics, would you want those Dharmics to try and influence those Trumpists in, in a direction that was perhaps less harmful and, and more adaptive to their continuing survival? <laughs> to our continuing survival, yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> yes, to my survival, I would like mm. them not to have, not to be Trumpists. Well, but I could you I see Dharma as, as, as an evolutionary adaptation to... to circumstances I, it's that's i think that's the point isn't it it's that it's not well my i think what i'm saying is it's not evolutionary it is but it the facilities we have that have come through evolution allow us the potential to speed up that that survival and i mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it's actually made things much worse because if we hadn't had science or a, a rational thought process, we wouldn't have got ourselves into the mess that we had. We'd still be hunter gatherers and we would not have dis been destroying the planet. Correct, yes. So, poof. I think you, you'd, we're, on a, we're on your trajectory already. I mean, we've had because I, I take that on board with her if i come from you know that's kind of heidegger language we have we have made this world for a good many people in this world it makes completely sense uh to to be have a god in the world but there was a margin there's a marginal practice of maybe 10 percent who are not theists who think there is no god so this is all we have um, so at the moment, that's a marginal practice, but it has great potential for the people in the world that believes in something, but uh, it's not uh, God anymore. Um, it just takes uh, basic care of mortality. Um, so that's the last step that cannot be done yet. But for those, uh, secular Dharma would absolutely be an option for how to live well how to uh, be with others, how to have an ethics, for example. So um, from the marginal practice of uh, atheists, uh, uh, it comes in as a, as a, a tuition, an, an, an offer to all agnostics in the world, which is a much bigger uh, percentage, maybe 40%. Um, and so it has, it has actually great growth potential where Dharma might be useful and meaningful to all those people. And then it becomes a bigger movement. And uh, can, can, uh, uh, has always benefited movements, beliefs, absolutely. So truths have always benefited that. It's a bit, it's, it's, it's questionable because it's so at the heart of secular Dharma for me to do without truths, but it it it's it would be a new adventure and maybe it has to be a belief and a truth of science which has to stand in there for people to come on board and i think that will happen anyway we are only in the uprising of science as the as the new big belief because we need it to save the planet, basically. I think that scientists, it's, it's, I, I, I see it happening in this pandemic. You know, only a couple of years ago, Michael Gove, um, here in uh, uh, one of the Tories here, could say, who needs experts? Scientists, you know, just get them away from me. I believe in Brexit, for example. Uh, but now, in this pandemic, scientists are becoming the new gods you know or the high priests let's say not the gods but the high priests and everything they say is much more revered and they are on the radio and the media every day and everyone 
worships at their altar of science. And so we are up, this is happening in front of our eyes and it won't go away. It will immediately get itself launched to climate change and, and science will rule. I, th I, I think it's, it's happening. So can secular Dharma be alongside that? And if it sits well, like with Rupert, then it might actually be something that has p real potential. <laughs> well, that's a that's a that's a happy thought. <laughs> but if climate change has this, this climate change scientists are, are as influential as as COVID scientists, as immunologists, that would be wonderful. I'm not. I'm not I, sure. I, I have. I. I think it won't ever. You know these these uh, scientific advisory panels that will stay people will say what good evidence have you got we, we are getting educated into science at the moment like no time before and and uh, the scientists have a status like they had at no time before where everyone is looking to them for our salvation yeah it's true that's true that has never been like that before it was always a specialist interest now it's about survival that will stick Well, I, I hope so. That would be that would be joyful. <laughs> it's not the best, bad, bad, worst solution. Yeah, it's not. No, I think it's it has a lot more going for it than the next um, uh, despot or you know um, because uh, usually there's a panel involved rather than one person. And, and, and that's already good because then we discuss something in the, in the public sphere. The science comes with discussion, uh, with, with debate, uh, rather than with pronouncing something. And that surely is also politically an, a, a huge advantage, you know, because it's plural by its setup. Whereas, uh, you know, there's one Trump and he says, and there's one Jesus and they, they, he says, and it's usually seems to be men. <laughs> yeah. So it, I like the plurality of science and uh, it might get us back into a, a, a politics of debate, meaningful debate, not just slamming others, but hey, well, I think that the evidence is more like this, more like that. And from you know, it's such a, a far, a fast movement here from uh, what do science have to say about this? This is politics. It's now completely swapped into the other direction. Politics isn't allowed to state anything. And in this country, it's amazing in the media, if you watch. Now politicians cannot say a thing anymore without getting walloped with science. <laughs> it's just, just within a couple of years. This is the biggest change in cul culture that I have ever witnessed, certainly in my years. Well, and that's... Uh... <laughs> wouldn't have thought that COVID had such a beneficial effect. It might be worth having. Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to have to go. Me too. Yeah. yeah. I've been called yeah. for dinner. I... It's been amazing. Yeah. Dinner. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had breakfast yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, God, as hurts. always a pleasure and you're totally right and I I just um, I bow to you okay no you're totally right <laughs> you speak the truth <laughs> Elfie you and Gary speak the truth oh, no, both I'm wrong. just here to learn <laughs> <laughs> you're both wrong <laughs> <laughs> oh Gary good luck okay. with your with, yeah. yes hey. oh, 
We well, have to meet, but then you have yeah. to tell us about your group. You have to inform on your group. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah shall we? we want shall to we? know all the ghastliness. <laughs> yeah, I'll, you know, I've got to really temper myself and say, okay, breathe, breathe. <laughs> yeah. no you know. yeah. All that. Okay. Yeah. Hey, okay. let's see okay. how it see is next then. week. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. remember, okay. the prep. Well, see you on Saturday. Yep. It's not. Okay. Is it this Saturday? It's this Saturday. <gasps> yes, this oh Saturday. my lord. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. We might yeah. need to meet next week. We need all the lowdown. Definitely need to meet next week. <laughs> cool. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. See you then. <laughs>